let's um, get started. So hopefully you've still got your bookmark in, in Daniel chapter 7, uh, because remember, just like last week, we haven't really finished, not quite, we're very close to being finished, um, and then also in Revelation chapter 17, uh, put your bookmark there as well, because we'll be going a little bit backwards and forwards, and, and Daniel chapter 2, and things like that, so... Um, just to refresh our memories, as usual, like to be refreshed. There we go. Okay. So um, we very should be very familiar with the two um, places. That's Daniel chapter two, and the image of Nebuchadnezzar, starting from Babylon and looking at the empires from his point of view or from his empire, so the Babylonian Empire, and then down to Christ's kingdom. And then the one we read about in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 10, where it goes from Egypt right down to Christ's kingdom. Well, actually, Christ's kingdom isn't mentioned there. That's why I've colored it blue. Um, but uh, it's obviously has to be there because of Christ's kingdom in Daniel chapter 2. So... Um, well, let's take a little bit of a closer look as we just sort of quickly go over what we did last week. Now, I'm not going to preach the same length of time as what I did last week. I'm sorry about that. And uh, I know that we were all excited. I was excited. And uh, we got really excited when I went over an hour. But I'll try not to do that. So let's look at this a little bit further. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. Because this is really the crux of the matter. Okay? Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, is really a, an unlocking key. So remember that Daniel, uh, and, and as you have in that handout that I gave you, was it last week, the little handout, the orange thingy? Um, so you see that it's Nebuchadnezzar's dream was from man's point of view. And now we see in Daniel chapter 7, it's God's point of view. So we have man's point of view, and we have God's point of view. And so in verses 7 and 8, um, after this I saw, well let's pick, up, pick it up uh, from verse 1. Let's get the whole thing so we know where we're going with this. So, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of, uh, of his head upon his bed. Now, the vision that he has is no different than the, in the sense than the vision that he had, or that Nebuchadnezzar had. The Nebuchadnezzar's was a, from a man's point of view, and this is from a God's, God's point of view, right? So it's the same vision. It has to be the same. The prophecy has to be the same. But it's just a different look at the prophecy. It's a bit like the Gospels. So you have someone that looks at the Gospels from one direction, like Matthew saw it from one way, and Mark saw it from another way, and, and Luke saw it from another way. So... Um, it's just a way of looking at these prophecies. And here we, go, we see that God gives um, Daniel a dream and, and visions of his, uh, of his head upon his bed. So he's actually asleep in bed. And then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. So Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, and, and behold another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in his mouth of it, uh, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of, of it four wings of a fowl. The um, beast had also four heads and, and dominion was given to it and if you want a little bit of background that's the the grecian empire that was broken after alexander the great died and it was split into four heads 
um, the, the split amongst the generals of his time, but that's all history. Uh, verse 7, uh, after this, which is what we want, verse 7 and verse 8, after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Okay, so we, he sees this beast, which has, which was different, it says um, diverse, which means it was quite different from the other beasts. So, you know, we see in verse 4, a lion. Now everybody knows what a lion looks like. Uh, okay, it's a bit strange that it's got eagle's wings, but okay, we know what it is like and then it goes on to a bear okay a second was like unto a bear we know what a bear looks like and um, whether it's a black bear or a brown bear that's a material but it was a bear and, and they all knew what it looked like and then it goes on to in verse 6 a leopard so most that's all recognizable animals um, in Daniel's time in our time we would recognize those animals just as well but you see, the point is this last beast, which is diverse, which is different or completely different from any of the other beasts that he's seen. Completely different than any of the other beasts. And so he dwells on it a little bit more. And verse 8, um, And I considered the horns. Now this beast had uh, ten horns. And I considered the horns. In other words, he, he was beginning to look at the horns. And behold... There came up among them another little horn, before whom uh, there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in, his horn, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and, his, and a mouth, speaking great things. So this fourth beast wasn't like any other animal that they, he recognized. It had ten horns. I'm not sure, but I don't know of any animal that's got ten horns. Now, we talk about the unicorn. Some people think the unicorn is the rhinoceros. Uh, whether or not that animal existed, and whether it's just a mythological figure, but the, the word itself is in the Bible. Uh, so, I'm just accepting that there was probably some animal that was named like a unicorn. Uni meaning one, like a unicycle. Okay? So, it had one horn. And some people believe that this is could be the rhinoceros, but I mean that's a little um, a little rabbit trail. So we'll just head back to where we're from. So this animal had ten horns, okay? So it was a decker horn. It had ten horns. So it wasn't like an ordinary animal. If we look at Revelation chapter seventeen verse sixteen. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore and make her desolate. Okay, let's just go back to Revelation chapter uh, chapter 17. Because we just want to pick this up. Because in Daniel chapter 7, it talks about this beast having ten horns. And the ten horns represent ten kings. Okay, the horns represent kings. So let's go to Revelation 17. Um, where are we going to pick this up from? Um, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in, in purple and scarlet, etc. And... If we come down a little bit further, um, verse 9, and, he, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and the seven, of, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Okay, So the conclusion is that 
these the vision, which is basically the same, and it has to be the same for the Bible to be uh, matched together. Okay, and so clearly there's this. Uh, what's happening, as we saw last week, this political struggle uh, for world power. And these ten kings, okay, the ten horns, which the Bible interprets as ten kings, hate the whore. Now remember the woman riding the beast. The woman that's riding the beast, and the one that's in control of the beast is the one that's riding the beast. Okay? And so we see that they these ten kings... The ten horns hate the whore, which is the not the antichrist but the false prophet. Okay, so these ten kings hate the false prophet, and we saw a bit more of that. I'm just sort of going quickly over what we did last week. And make her desolate with the naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their heart, in their hearts, to fulfil His will, and to to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. Okay, so. Clearly, this is political struggle between religious, religious Rome, and we have these ten kings who have not yet received. So if we go back to Revelation 17, you'll notice there that verse 12, and the ten horns which thou sawest, the ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. So they're sitting in the background. It's so a tribulation period. These ten kings are sitting in the background. Very much like what's happening here in Daniel chapter 7. So the ten horns. And Daniel's looking at these ten horns. And then something happens. Something happens. Now verse 8 of uh, Daniel chapter 7. So we're flicking a little bit backwards and forwards. It says, I considered the, the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn. Before whom there were three of the first horns. <coughs> plucked up by the roots. And behold, <clears throat> in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. So this is obviously the Antichrist. So during the tribulation period, which is seven years long, the first, as we saw last week, the first three and a half years, basically re religious Rome is in control. The woman that rides the beast. The ten kings are sitting in the background and is looking for an opportunity. And remember what happens in heaven. Satan has a battle with Michael and his angels, loses the fight, and it's woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And so we see that um, Satan comes down and then indwells the Antichrist. It's that that we're, we're looking at here. Because we saw, as we saw last week, as well in... Um, Daniel chapter 7 about the time and times and dividing of time. So it's three and a half years. But we know the tribulation is seven years long. But the last three and a half years is the great tribulation. The great tribulation. So clearly there's a political struggle going on with these ten kings who haven't received a kingdom. Because they're not in power. They're not in control of the world. Rome. Religious power. The woman that's riding the beast is in power. And these ten horns, these ten kings then hate the war and then make her desolate and naked. And In other words, make war uh, with her. And so this world power between the religious and the secular world rule, as we see in Revelation 17, 18, and the ten kings, right? they sit what seems idly by, Okay, in the first half of the tribulation period, the Antichrist is on the scene. He's made a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. He's made this peace treaty. Peace treaty. He's just he's a, a prominent figure, but he's not the world leader. It's the Roman Empire in the sense of the, the cardinals, the popes, and the, all those religious leaders that are, are in control. The woman who's riding this beast. And then, at one point in time, at the middle of the tribulation period, then the Antichrist is indwelt by Satan. And that's when all hell breaks loose. Okay? So until the time comes for the Lord to usurp and take power from that false prophet, okay, for God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast. 
So the, the kingdom which the false prophet had is now going to be given, or the kings who have the victory will give that power to the Antichrist or to Satan, the indwelling of the Antichrist. And so uh, uh, the world rule, um, so we see here, we see the um, United Europe picture here, so of the woman riding the beast and of course her stars uh, around it, so that's the European flag. But it's very similar to all these other pictures with the stars of Mary. Okay? So it's very much what we're talking about. And of course, you know, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. You're not allowed to make stuff up. Otherwise, you'll stuff up. Get it? Here is um, some more. This is, again, the uh, European Union. Um, parliament building, but look at the look at the, all this these shapes and things that are very much like the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel, where the languages were confused. Okay, one world power. You can't make this stuff up. Then you have again some more pictures of woman riding the beast. Okay, here's one der Spiegel from Germany here. And it says, Good Morgen, Europa. So there's a woman riding a beast. And stamps. And here's another stamp. And then a, um, all these caricatures of, of these statues of women riding some sort of beast. You can't make this stuff up. Here again, some more statues. Notice this little chair whispering in the ear. You know, it's demonic. Demonic. You can't make this stuff up. Here are coins. European coins. Woman riding the beast. Okay? And, and these are real coins. You can't make this stuff up. Look, here's this angel. You know, remember the angel that was whispering? If we go back to this statue here, this little chair whispering in the ear. And there's a stamp. The little angel. There's one there. Roman rule, power. You can't make this stuff up. So the world is already beginning to look like the false prophet and, the, and getting ready for the Antichrist reign. Everything is pointing to that. You can't make it up because that's what we should be looking for and say, hey, the time is very short when the Lord will return. Very short. Um, okay, so let's try and put it all together. So Seventh Kingdom is the revived Roman Empire. Okay, the revived Roman Empire comes on the scene. And the Church of Rome, as the um, whore, is in control. Is in control of the world. Okay, Roman rule. What's, what's the the um, religious area called, what's a little country which has a wall around it, which Vatican America isn't allowed to, but it? Vatican. Vatican City. Yeah, Vatican City. And so we see the Church of Rome, Roman Empire, Vatican City is very much going to be in control. Going to be in control. In the first half of the tribulation, the woman that rides the beast. Let's go back to Revelation 17. So hopefully you haven't lost your bookmark there, but verses 3 and verse 18. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And we've already looked at the, the, the uh, woman that's riding the beast. So that's the not the Antichrist, but the false prophet. The false prophet. And of course... We see that the scarlet was the color of uh, Rome and also the, the religious Rome now, the, the cardinals, they wear that uh, color as well. Down to verse 18. Um, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. 
So the woman is in control who is reigning over the kings of the earth. These ten kings, the kings of the earth, are sitting there and she, they're being ruled over. And of course they don't want to be ruled over. And you see that in Daniel chapter 7, when Daniel looks at and sees these ten horns, all of a sudden there's this little horn that comes up, which is the Antichrist. Although the Antichrist is already on the scene, but he also is being ruled over by religious Rome. So the kings of the earth, in verse 18, the kings of the earth are being reigned over by Vatican City, basically. She is in control of the world. She's in control. Right at the beginning of the tribulation, she is in control. She takes control. Yes, the Antichrist is still on the scene. Yes, you'll be able to say, well, he's, well, if you are still around, and I hope none of you will be around, but you'll be able to say, well, that's the Antichrist, right? But he's a good guy. He's made a peace treaty and, and all that sort of thing. He's a man of peace. It's not until the middle of the tribulation that things go really, really wrong. So, and rules the kings of the earth from Rome. That's where the rule comes from, right at the beginning of the tribulation. It's not until the middle of the tribulation that the Antichrist, who is indwelt by Satan, then removes himself and will rule from Jerusalem. Because obviously Satan wants to be worshipped. And he will want to do that from Jerusalem. Because he wants to be God. That's what his ultimate goal is, to be God. But the job obviously is not available. So meanwhile, the beast lies waiting. So we have the, the beginning of the tribulation, you have this religious rule, world rule, and the religion is ruling over the kings of the earth, and they're all sit, sitting what seems idly by. Okay? What seems like they're sitting, sitting, sitting idly by. They're not happy. They're not happy. Because if you look down, uh, back down in verse um, 12 again, the ten horns which thou sawest, the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast, and have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So that's at the end of the tribulation period when all that happens. Okay? So, at the midpoint of the tribulation period, the beast rebels against the woman in verse 16. The ten horns which thou sawest, Upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and, the, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So the religious side of that, the control, religious control, will cease. Will cease. And you end up with a political power. A political power rather than a religious power. Although both are in existence. Okay? Just keep that in mind. The Antichrist and the false prophet are existing for the seven years. It's just the control of world power that's the issue here. Okay? That's what we're looking at, the world power. So, it's initiated by the little horn, which we see if we go back to... So keep your finger in Revelation 17, or put a bookmark there, and go back to Daniel chapter 7. Um, so verse um, 8 and then we'll drop down a few verses I considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots and behold in th this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things so we have ten horns, and then one little horn that pops up. 
is not part of the 10, but it's 10 plus 1. 10 plus 1 is 11, right? So there's 10 horns, and in the middle of that comes up. And let's go down to verse 24. So Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, where the Lord interprets what he see, what uh, Daniel is seeing. Um, verse 23, so that is verse 24 we want to be most uh, familiar with, but verse 23, thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings. A ten kings. That shall arise. And another, so ten plus one, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the, from the first. So from the first ten kings, and then the next one king, he's going to be different from all the other kings. Kings, ten kings. We know he's going to be different because he's going to be indwelt by Satan. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So just go back to verse 8, you'll see that the first horn plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn, okay, where are we? Um, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up. So ten horns, three plucked up, when one comes up. Okay? So once the world's Roman religious system is overthrown, the battle that ensues destroys or subdues three out of those ten kings. So, the beginning of the tribulation period, there's ten kings. They're being ruled over by religious Rome. The false prophet. They're being ruled over. They don't like it. They hate the whore. Because they want political power, not religious power. Okay? So, one horn comes up out of those ten. Not one of the ten, but an extra one comes up. And in the process of time, three get plucked up or subdued, as the Bible calls it in verse 24, subdued. And in verse 7, it talks about being plucked up. Or verse 8, chapter 7, gets plucked up. So there's seven left, which now give their power to the Antichrist. So now religious Rome has been defeated. They're still there. But now religious Rome is subservient to the Antichrist. It's a political reign, not a religious reign, from the middle of the tribulation onwards. As Satan, is, as Satan indwells the Antichrist. So, they either relinquish their kingship, or the, uh, the remainder seven kings give power to the Antichrist. So either the battle that ensues, this little horn that comes up from between the ten and three are plucked up, either they, they die or they're still around and just give their power over to the others. Okay? So it's, I struggled with subduing and being plucked up. Now, the plucked up was an image or part of his dream in, in uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, where it talks about these three kings, or these three horns were plucked up. So either they are plucked up. When you pluck up something, it, it dies, doesn't it? It disappears. And yet, over in verse 24 of that same chapter, when God explains it, he talks about subduing them, which means that you have power over them or you, you take away their power. So whether they're destroyed or they just hand over their power, whatever, uh, I'm not uh, too sure. So we've already looked at Daniel 7, uh, 28, uh, 7, 8, sorry. Let's go to verse 9. 
verse 9. So Daniel 7, verse 9. Yeah, 8. Of, well, we've looked at 8 before, so do you want me to read verse 8 again? No. Chapter Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I see what you're trying to say. Sorry. Um, chapter 8 then, verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great, toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Now the pleasant land is which? Israel. Israel. So the Antichrist, now the power, is no longer in the Vatican City. They've lost that power. The ten kings have taken the power of the earth. And now he's got his eyes... The Antichrist has got his eyes on the north or the, the east and the west and also the, the pleasant land. That's where he's going to rule from. Because what is he going to do? In the middle of the week, he's going to set himself up in the temple, isn't he? He's going to be wanting to be worshipped in the temple. He will break that peace treaty. It's all be broken. Be gone. Revelation 17, 17. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So in other words, they are going to continue the rule now until God says it's enough when he returns. And that's at the end of seven years, or end of three and a half years. So, now, whether these three kings are destroyed in battle, as I said before, or, or they are destroyed or subdued by the Antichrist and lose their kingship in Daniel 7.24, I'm not too sure. And we'll, sometimes you just have to wait and see what happens to these three kings. In any case, the Antichrist comes out from between these three kings, but was not part of the original ten. Just remember, ten kings... The Antichrist is not part of those ten kings. He's not one of he's not number one king, he's not number two king, he's not number three king, he's not number four king, he's not number five king, he's not number six king, he's not number seven king, he's not number eight king, and guess what? He's not number nine king either. And he's not number ten king. He comes out from between them. He is a political person, but he doesn't have the power. It's not until the Antichrist is indwelled by Satan. He has actually this power that comes along and takes over the world and, and defeats three of the kings. So ten original kings minus three kings who are subdued leaves seven kings. Okay? Ten kings, three are plucked up, three are plucked up or subdued, that leaves seven. Because well, I can do the math. Ten minus three is seven. Now, the little horn, one king equals Satan and dwelt Antichrist, the little horn, okay, it comes out in Daniel 7, 8 and 24, between these two horns. So we have ten horns, and in the middle comes out this little horn. Three are now subdued to leave seven plus the little horn. Okay, so now we still, we have eight horns. One's a little horn, or described as a little horn, but um, whether or not he's a, a prince or whatever, I don't know. I don't know what, what that means by little horn, but he grows up. And the, so seven plus one is eight. So the, so is the eighth king indwelt Antichrist? Oh, this is not, that's not worded very well. And of the seven kings that are left. Let's go to Daniel chapter 17. Uh, Revelation 17, sorry. Revelation 17. So, let's pick it up from verse 10. Okay. There are seven kings, five have fallen, and one is, now remember, those are the world empires. In fact, you should have a little slip of paper that I got handed out a moment ago. You've got those seven world empires, right? So you have the Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, right through to the one that is 
and one to come, and then Christ's kingdom beyond that. So you have those. And we looked at this verse here, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And we looked at that, and we saw that that was the back in Daniel times and times and half a time. Now, verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Now, seven, he is the eighth. Ten minus three, seven. He is the eighth. He is of the seven, which becomes the eighth, right? He is the eighth king. Not eighth kingdom, but king. King. There's ten kings who are on the world who have received no rulers yet. But they hate the whore. They hate the religious world system. They hate that the religion is in control of the world. So they make war with the whore and the Antichrist who comes up destroys three. They make seven and he the Antichrist itself, the little horn, makes the eighth. So, there could be a double fulfillment here. So, Revelation 17, um, he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. The beast indicates empire, horns indicate kings. Okay? So, the beast itself means empire. That's when we see in Daniel chapter 7, we see the, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. They're all empires. The head of gold, empire, silver, brass, down to the iron, are all empires, world empires. So this beast indicates an empire with the horns that indicates the kings, the kings that are in charge. Each kingdom has a king. Since the seventh king has been destroyed, the eighth king comes to power. So on your little slip of paper, you will see that the seventh kingdom, which is the tribulation period, and the seventh power, the, the seventh kingdom, the power itself is being relinquished. So we still have seven kingdoms, but the seventh kingdom, which was under the rule of the false prophet, now is no longer under the false prophet, but is now ruled under the Antichrist from the middle of the tribulation. So one takes over from the other. Um, not another kingdom, nor another empire, because there's only so many empires... Okay, but another king for that seventh empire. And Revelation 17, verses 16 and 17. Um, verse 16, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. And... The, the symbolism there of, of Babylon is, is burnt and the wailing and, and all those sort of things that will happen. But that's another story. Verse 17, For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So, there's still only seven world empires plus Christ's eternal kingdom, which is the eighth. Perfectly consistent with Daniel. Perfectly consistent with Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Perfectly consistent. The, the thing that happens in here is the seventh empire, but it's broken in half. It's broken in half. We see the false prophet rules for the first half. The ten kings, the ten kings will re make war against the false prophet and that will, um, well the Antichrist comes out from that as well. And I've got 
here, while well, you'll see it on your sheet anyway, the, the verse sort of broken down of the, um, the, the periods of time and how it's going to work. And over here, again, some more uh, verses and things that you can look up uh, yourself. So the ten kings rebel against the false prophet, are victorious. Revelation 17, 16, uh, make them victorious. And another king rises up and subdues three of the ten kings who give their kingdom to the Antichrist who rules from Jerusalem. So no longer will the rule be from the Vatican City. It will be now turned over to rule in Jerusalem because the Antichrist is indwelt. And so the eighth king is part of the seven kingdoms, which includes the seventh kingdom. So the seven kingdoms, okay, the eighth king is part of that seventh kingdom, and the eighth king is part of the seven remaining ten kings. Ten kings, three are subdued, make seven, plus one is, so the eighth one is part of that. I just want to go through just a few more slides, and then I'll finish this evening. Um, firstly, which three kings fall? That went through my mind. We have ten kings, three fall, right? Three have fallen. Which three kings? We already know that the world is divided up into ten kingdoms, ten different areas. The world is already divided up in that. So... In the middle of the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to be indwelled by Satan. Will the indwelling Antichrist arise out of Europe? Will he come out of Europe? That means that three of these kings in Europe, right, including the one from Africa here, these ten, these two, seven, and five, will they now be subdued or destroyed? Is it those, ten, those three kings? Because three kings have to be subdued in the middle of tribulation. Or is it ones from the east, the kings of the east? Now remember that if you get the Herald of Hope magazine, there's an article about in there about the war uh, of the east, the kings from the east, drying up the river Euphrates to bring the kings of the east across. So will it be that the Antichrist will subdue these kings? I don't know. Um, or will it be from the, in the southern hemisphere? Will the three kings which fall, will it be the southern hemisphere? Or will it be from um, Europe here? Or North Africa? Areas 2, 1, 2, and 7. Will the indwelling Antichrist arise out of the Americas? I don't know. I don't know. It'll take a little bit more study to, to see if we can nut it out. But I've already done a lot. I'll, I'll pass it over to Jan. She can look for that one. Okay. Um, and we'll pick this up a little bit more about the Antichrist himself. So, when you look at uh, this, um, uh, it was a little bit mind-blowing. And there's a lot of information that I've passed on to you guys. And uh, it's just for you to check out to see if you agree or disagree. Um, you have to try and back it up with scripture um, for me to agree or disagree with you. Um, and certainly that is the only explanation that I can give for that verse 11. He is the seven, or he's of the seven, which is also the eighth and the eighth king. And the seventh, the seventh empire, and he's the eighth king that comes from that. Anyway, let's um, finish this evening. We'll close the word of prayer. And we'll pick it up again um, a little bit more as we go through. And we look at the temple and, and a few things um, of the Antichrist's reign. All right. I've still got 137 slides to go. Well, that's where I got up to. Probably add a few more to that. Let's pray.